Advice. The theory that deja vu is a momentary crossover between yourself and a parallel universe's version of you is no longer just a theory. It is a cosmic alignment and I have proven it to be true. After years of intense focus and exhausting efforts, I learned to recognize and manipulate that alignment. It was a terrifying concept as all virgin realms of exploration are, but the notion of being able to traverse the ether afforded a level of exhilaration unmatched. The calculated numbness of the moment crept in as I sat in the park staring out over Silence Lake, admiring the surface of water that was as calm as its name suggests and personified the tenuous separation between realities. Immeasurable the breadth of existence as as chaotic and infinite below the surface as it is above. To the watery denizens of the lake, the birds, asphalt, and clouds are but an eccentric theory, to be sure, and the opposite is also true. However, their tethered existence manifests dependency, albeit blindly and purely faithful. For the sunfish, the pronged, baited hooks lie only within the fairy tales spun to terrify younglings, and it is only once the hook penetrates the surface of the water, and the bait is taken, that horrific reality of a breached connection is understood. The sunfish is then ripped from his plane to become a martyr to his scaly brethren, and never to return. He exists only as a protagonist of future tales, chronicling his misadventures with the other world, a cautionary myth to never be tempted by the corrupt machinations of those unseen. The air of the park swirled around me when the unmistakable blur of the alignment began to take over like cylinders of a lock sliding into place. I knew he was there. His emotions were potent and foreign to me. There was a heightened contentment for life inside of him and the anger at birth within me was indescribable. He did not deserve such happiness. I had to know, I had to have, what made him so happy. In all practicality, the plan was simple usurp and dispose of that other me. His elation stung my senses, turning to ashes in my mouth. Then a voice rang in my ears, shifting my focus. It was the voice of my wife, Maggie. It was the baited hook and it clawed at my heart. I couldn't wait to bite. In my universe, she left me seven years prior, but right then, I instantly knew why he was so happy. My motivations were stronger than ever. The exchange was breathtaking and I could feel his confusion dissolving into desperation, a magnificence of math, physics, and ancient world meditations. There would be no need for physical contact with him, nor would he and I be granted simultaneous existence. Erinus duplication is not a solid state facet of a knowing universe. He would not be erased out of existence entirely, but only one of us is ever allowed to be in any given dimension at any given time. No, it would not be a violent or forceful act, just a simple substitution of he with myself. The math behind the exchange is messy, but when left to the knowing, the results would appear seamless to onlookers. In mere moments, he was losing everything. Moreover, I was giving him everything I had, which was nothing. My holy, sad, and empty life would now be his. The rush of adrenaline crawling through me during those brief seconds was nigh orgasmic. Something unexpected happened during the final moments of the exchange. A small but powerful explosion closed the connection of our two worlds. Then he was gone and I heard Maggie scream. My eyes had not fully focused after it happened, but I felt as natural in that world as if in my own. The exchange had been a success. I called for my wife, but got no response. I cursed my sight to return and yelled for her again. All my senses rang like exposed nerves, new to his reality and the freshness 
I was absorbing. Every photon of sunlight, every twinkling fleck of dust, and every distant hum of the living world brought a wildfire to my body. As my vision cleared, a paralyzing feeling grew in my gut. I tasted the familiar rot of bile I had suffered years before when the officer called me with the news that they had found Maggie's car in the river. He informed me that there had been some sort of explosion sending her car off the bridge and that she died upon impact with the water. He assured me that it was instant and painless for her, but for me, his words were agonizing. My voice echoed throughout the park as again I screamed, begging her to answer. Face down in the lake I found her floating. Whether the explosion killed her or the force of it propelled her into the lake where she drowned was a moot point. She was dead, and that's all that mattered. I fell to my knees, painfully loathing that new life as I had my previous one. It was a most cruel and cosmic punishment. I lost my soulmate in two different existences, and there was no denying that this time it was my fault. A gust of wind produced tiny waves across the lake's glassy surface, and I watched her floating body for a few seconds longer before a chuckle escaped my mouth. I wallowed in the ponderous depths of hope, thinking, plotting, and planning. I rose to my feet, confidently, turned away from the lake, and headed toward the exit. The tragedy of that day's events faded quickly, and I could not stop smiling at the thrill of the possibilities before me. There are an infinite number of Maggies across the many cosmos, I thought, I had just killed myself to be with her, and I would be happy to do it again.